And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that is Devil's Canoe, the two, the two brothers studio, create, um, sorry, I worked myself up a bit, developing the monster battling insanity that is Diamond Duelers, which we'll be getting into today. In the red corner, we, ha we have Mac Lindgren, and in the blue corner, we have Lindy Ingren. <laughs> Close. Indy yeah, Lindgren. In Indy Lindgren. What? I don't know what. I don't know where that came from. It's but okay. How, how are you two doing today? Doing good. Good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, I suppose I'll start at the humble beginnings. Um, where did, was Diamond Duelers something where th where the idea came to you guys recently, or was this an idea that had been? Um, stewing about for a while. Ooh, do you want to take that one, Steve? Mac? Sure. So, back when we were kids, <laughs> we were really close with our cousins and whatnot, and we would jump on the tramp or, you know, run in the wilderness and we'd play games where, similar to what is like D&D, &D, right? You have somebody telling a story and, and everyone else is playing. And... My brother Indy came up with a game where there was, you know, monsters and there were puzzles and all these cool things. And we used to play that all the time and we called it Diamond Duelers. Um, later in life, nowadays, it's been a few years now, we've been in Blender and Unreal Engine and we've been self-taught and trying to figure this out. And we finally got to a point where we're like, hey, we can make a game now. Like, what should we do? And we, we went through all the ideas that we had and we thought, well, why don't we make that a reality? And so, so yeah, that's pretty much how that came about. Mm -hmm. Decades old at this point, the idea. Yeah, it, def it definitely sounds like. So I'm get I'm guessing that for the longest time, you guys had some sort of um, no, some sort of notebook or the like that was just chock full of of random and not so random ideas on what to do. No, yeah, plenty of notebooks, lots of drawings, lots of ideas. It's there's a, a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff around it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, with that, with that in mind, you get, you guys are doing a. Well, well, before I can, before I can even get into into that part, um, I'm fa I'm fairly certain that people that people have made Pokemon comparisons with what you're doing. Um, was the was like G1 era in a direct influence, or was that um, just ha was that a happy accident? I I think so. Uh, do you want to take this one, or you want me to take this one? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give my take on it. So I am a, a lifelong Pokemon fan, among other things like Morrowind, and Final Fantasy Tactics, and I'm a gamer through and through. And um, yeah, monster catching is definitely not an original idea of ours. But everything else that'll follow in the game very much will be. There's a very sandbox feel. Like, let's say you come across a, a mushroom in this world, like, you'll be able to bounce off of it, or maybe you'll use your lightning guy and shoot it, and it will super bounce. Yeah, or <laughs> everything in the world will have multiple things that it can do, and it'll be much of the game will be spent sandboxing while you're figuring out these puzzles. And to that to that particular end, um, you you end up you, you end up calling it um, Diamond Duelers. I'm and one one of the things that I did notice is that gem is that gemstones do pl do play a factor into a lot of it. What, so how did that come about? Yeah, so the the gemstones play a part in the core um, like story of it all but um, the the capturing mechanic is you have these these big sword like things called cleavers 
Um, and you have a gem socketed in them. And each sword has its own, like, ability, like an enchanted weapon from Skyrim or something, right? Maybe it does fire damage, maybe it does more damage versus flying foes or whatever it is. And then if you get the finishing blow on a beast, it sucks it into the gem in your cleaver, mm -hmm. and then it imprints on them the ability of the weapon, and then the then the um, and the ability of the gems. So the gems would have things, and then the weapons have things. But the gem is a one-time use, right? Once it's caught, it's imprinted, and it's in that gem. Mm -hmm. And then the sword could continue to put those in. So you'll have multiple different swords and different gem combinations to really set up your your team and strategize around. Mm -hmm. And what? Where's the difference? Where's the line between that and the um, egg? So at the start of the game, your character receives an egg, and it's in this like gumball, giant gumball machine thing. Mm -hmm. And it comes out, and it's randomized from like the entire creature list. Um, so it comes down there. You get the egg, and then you can um, travel with it, and you can still fight on your own. Because in this game, it's like it's more similar to like the Final Fantasy, how you fight with your creatures and whatnot. You are also have like a character sheet and and level up and what and so the egg though like if let's say you go heal at a hot spring or you go on the beach or whatever it it affects your egg like there's these weights for each action you take and it could change what it ends up evolving into because these family lines they like branch over to each other in different areas but yeah I want to say one thing about the egg and the gumball machine. Um, our eggs being stored in this gumball machine, it, it dates back to kind of the original idea back when we were children. Um, and it, it really comes from just the idea, the excitement of the, the toys in the gumball machine that you'd get as a kid. And I have to say, when I started playing uh, Tears of the Kingdom recently and I saw the gumball machines in it that dispense these machine parts I was a little I was a little disheartened at the timing <laughs> I was like because uh, it, it looks very similar to that um, and so yeah I would just like to say we, we did come up with that first <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well it it is that that is how these kind of things go. Although I I don't think that I don't think you're gonna have an instance of um, engineers' nightmares being being built like some people do with Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't think so. I would pay good money for an actual engine for an actual engineer to um, stream himself play, himself or him, herself playing that game just so I could see what's just so I could see what sort of insanity comes about it. What awful Korok tortures away. <laughs> oh. Well, <laughs> my my buddy summed it up summed it up best with one of them where he he set it up and then before he set the thing off he said, "Hi, I'm Link and welcome to Jackass." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very accurate. Some of the stuff I've seen. So the other and I will admit one of the things I found interesting is. If I'm understanding this proper, you are you're doing it where the where your where your player character is instead of having the monsters um, fight for them, um, is actually taking part in it themselves. Yeah, that's correct. But. What what brought that what brought that on was it just was it just how things came about or was that one of the things you wanted to do early on? Well, in the original game when we were we were kids and whatnot, it that was just kind of part of the game. If you threw your creature up in the air, you'd do some sort of crazy combo and you could follow it up with your attacks, and it was just kind of the flow of the game back then, and we wanted to capture that. Um, it, it feels more like an RPG in that sense than Pokemon does. There's more um, like Final Fantasy 3 when you're gathering your team and choosing who you like. It Or Final Fantasy Tactics even is a better example as they're fully customizable. Are you talking 3-3 three, three or 6-3? Three? 
<laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. The, the one on the Super Nintendo, they called three. <laughs> so six. Yeah, six. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it's important to bring that up because you're talking about choosing your party. You you didn't choose your party in the original three. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah. just one of those things to make to make sure that make sure that nobody nobody um gets confused. Right. Yeah. Right. Final, Final Fantasy Tactics is a better analogy. Anyway. Just without the item. Just without the item glitch. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. used it. I know everybody used it. There's no, there's no shame in admitting it. <laughs> Actually, I'm unfamiliar with the item glitch, and that's a hard game. <laughs> uh, there was an item duplication glitch that was rampant in the PS1 version. Oh man, I didn't, I didn't catch that trick. <laughs> I struggled through that game, but I, that was a lot of fun. Um. Now, with the with that in mind, uh, it it talks it talks about have that um the first monster that you get is going to be is going to be randomized from a list. Um, given that given that, um, how what sort of controls do you put in so that so that um the starting monster you get isn't going to be too isn't going to be too random. So, so the starting list will be any of them, right? But the thing is, they the evolution chains. Um, like, let's say you got this little cloud koala bear guy, right? Mm -hmm. He, you're maybe he has a chance to turn into something that would be deemed like legendary or really hard to get. Like, there's more paths. So, for instance, some characters you'll have to go to jail. For them to be able to affect it enough to when they evolve, they'll hit a certain branch. Some conditions will be so rare and different that you're not going to start with anything super powerful. All the base starting ones um, are relatively well; they are equal, but just have different priorities in their stats and their abilities and things. So, really, what you do with them after they hatch, well, and some what during the egg stage, will affect what they turn into long term. And a lot of those, it's going to require the player to like play the game enough to figure out what things affect them in certain ways. And it would be really hard to break down, but you should get a pretty good idea while playing of like what patterns help you to get certain effects. And so, for instance, the mention of like going to jail, right? Players are going to try and avoid going to jail in most instances. And so that one would be a rare effect. Um, because it's it's avoidable. People are going to try and avoid it. And there's not going to be like a direct outline or an NPC that tells you, hey, if you go here, this will happen. And so it, it is play as you go and, and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's, ju it's just when you when we're talking about full random in that in that degree, what instantly comes to mind is roguelikes. And that and that kind of randomization can be a double-edged sword in terms of how one progresses because it's not exactly built for a long campaign. It's built to be a game of chicken. Yeah, there's there's also um, there's also gems and stuff in the game that you can do that will keep your creature at that stage. So, for example, if you're like related to like Pokemon, if you super love Psyduck, but you're not a huge fan of Golduck, there are gems that you can give them that will give them the stat boosts as if they had evolved, but they remain in that state. But they're pretty hard to come by. But if you're really, really into Psyduck, right, you're gonna you're gonna want to get it. And that that brings me to another thing since we were bringing up Pokemon is Pokemon builds its largely builds itself on the advantage disadvantage relationship when it comes to types and attack types um, are you are you going to be doing something similar do you have a different approach in mind when it comes to varying the um, combat approach in, within the sandbox so there there will be type advantage it won't be as um, 
huge as it is in Pokemon, right? Like, if you have a lightning type that's level 40, he could probably take a level 60 of, of water, right? Um, it's not going to play a role that heavily, um, but it, it will affect it. And each creature has, has three elements in this, and they really dictate what moves they can learn more. Mm -hmm. And then the type advantage is a small bonus in addition to those. But, um, like, for instance, you can stack elements. Like, let's say you have Flareit, which is like this fire weasel creature, right? Mm -hmm. He's fire, fire, lightning. Those are his three. So some of them will be fire, 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 or you know, whatever, but some moves, moves get cost less of your mana to cast based on how much of the element you have of it. Um, but then, so you, you get more power, but you sacrifice diversity in moves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there, there will be, there will be a elemental advantage, but it's more for the moves and um, outside powers that you can use for puzzles and whatnot. And I can, I can certainly get that. And speaking of, I think one of the big things to address is whether or not you guys are doing a turn-based design with your combat system or a real-time design. It'll be turn-based. Well, turn-based in the actual, like, duels, but um, it will be uh, the other way in the, like, overworld. Do you want to right, explain so that kind of thing there? Yeah, so in the in the overworld with the puzzles and the and the whatnot that use your creatures elements to navigate through, um, there will be things called shadows. At least that's what we're calling them right now. They look like these silhouettes of beasts that come after you. Um, and that kind of combat will be similar to um, a link to the past. You have these bad guys that either pop out of the ground or they chase you or they you know, pop out of the ground, shoot a few lasers and go back, whatever whatever their combination is, you'll have these shadows that come after you in the game. You can hit them with your cleaver and knock them back or even destroy them in some cases. But if they hit you and deal damage to you, then it, it will initiate a fight like in Final Fantasy or mm -hmm. Legend of Dragoon or something where it sucks you in. Mm -hmm. um, and since grinding isn't a huge feature in this game compared to like most, you actually want to avoid most fights, especially if you're deep in a dungeon, because healing is a little bit more difficult. But, um, yeah, so there is a, a weird relationship between a 3D-like combat and then the, the 2D duels. But, yeah, that's, so he's right. There is, there is a 3D combat element to it, for sure. Yeah, it's one, it's one of those things I, wa I wanted to nail down, because I know some people have wanted to see um, full real t full real time combat with some with a monster battler, but I have I have um, fought back on that at every occasion because I realize how chaotic that could become. Well, the ma the main thing with that is the animations. If you have a diverse cast of you know five hundred plus creatures animating all of those, especially if they're unique and look different from each other, would be insane on an overworld, right? An animation takes days sometimes to do, and you'd have up to five at least for each creature, you know, let's say let's say it just took you half a day even, and you did all five for um, each and every one of those creatures. You're looking at years and years of... It's just not feasible for that. Oh. I remember. I remember when somebody asked somebody um, asked why the why they never tr why Square or or Enix never tried um, replicating the combat the combat s system that was used in Chrono Trigger. And the reason the reason for th the reason for that officially is that it was t is that it wasn't doing that was a nightmare to program. And I'd imagine it. I'd imagine that it's still that it'd still be the case because of all the different variables. Um, yeah. I. I yeah. In the same vein, I remember when Devil May Cry Four came out, and um, Capcom and Sa Capcom's studio was saying that the Devil Bringer was something they couldn't have done on the PS2, which seems ridiculous at first. I mean, it's just it's just a grapple it's just a grapple gimmick. But then, when you consider that you have to put in the, at least two unique animations for each enemy type, um, 
then it starts get then it starts getting a bit nuts. Yeah, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Especially in especially something that's built on being on being fast paced. Well, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that's the reason why so many bo- so many um, games in this boomer shooter renaissance we're in are are um, ju- are using jumped up versions of older setups and trying to use modern setups to do it because of the sheer amount of enemies they want to put on. Yeah, that's that's the problem with animation is it adds so much to the game. It looks so cool, but you have to be very stingy as a game developer where you put that because you're all of a sudden you're sacrificing quality of your game for showiness, and you kind of want to meet. I mean, it depends on your game what it's going for, but in a game like this, with we're stretching out the diversity of the creatures and the character sheets and what they're able to do, we had to cut somewhere and 500 animations. You know, times five is where we had to cut for sure. Mm-hmm. Some other, otherwise, you'd end up with the with the wall of notes like you're like you're that crazy detective. Yeah, or yeah, conspiracy the theories, whichever you prefer. Yeah, all all the str- <laughs> all the strings and all that. Um, and with with that in with that in mind, since you mentioned the three element um, setup. Is that is that more of a deter- it sounds like that's more of a determination of what abilities it can potentially learn. Yeah, so there'll there'll be there'll be the elements and there's twelve of them in this game. Hmm. Um so it's like shadow, fire, lightning, light, earth, wind, fire, metal or mechanical, and um magic and physical. I- plant as well mm-hmm. but um so each one of those elements has their um overworld application so like for instance um the flying type has like a glide like in spyro right so you can glide down and, and use that in puzzles the fighting type can push massive things and lift up big rocks and things mm-hmm. um and well anyways they each have their little thing that they do oh yeah ice type and it freezes them into a solid block and you can push that around or use it as a platform so they'll have all these puzzle things that, that you also need to keep aware that your team has enough of those to get through certain dungeons. Um, but the uh, they also, other than the elements, there's also like traits, like having hands or claws or horns or, or jaws or tail or whatever it might be that also limits what they can do as far as moves go. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are things in the game that you could get similar to that stone that, that stunts their growth, right? Um, that can change out one of your elements, which, that once again, they'd be rare and you'd, you'd fight to get them. They're not going to be everywhere. But, like, for instance, if you took, let's say, Psyduck, use something that people know, right? So mm-hmm. he'd be like a psychic water type and then maybe psychic water water. Mm-hmm. Say you want to switch out the psychic and put fire and you have one of those fire stones that you fought of a big bad to get and all of a sudden you have a Psyduck that's water water fire and he could learn some steam moves and stuff like that as well so there there is some crafting no no two teams are going to look the same like you get your friend together even if you have the same creatures they'd look so different by the end and that pr- I think what I'd be curious about when it, when it comes to that is what factor what what factor would play when you when it comes to having um the same element more than once, whether that whether that be two or three times, is it just the power of that el- that element, or is it a di- or is it something different? Okay, so you'll have your creatures will have a number of moves based on their like intelligence, that or wisdom, or there's a combination of two stats that will give them how many moves they can know. Um, and you're gonna want, especially if you have low intelligence, you're gonna want fairly weak moves in those elements, like. Let's say there was like a ice pick attack or something. Um, if if your creature has the element ice and that's like a level one move, he can do that all day. That's free. It doesn't cost him any of his mana. And so they have a certain mana for each battle. It resets at the end of each battle. Um, and so your bigger moves, let's say it's like a level three move, and I'll just keep it with these numbers, but mm-hmm. let's say it's a big, powerful attack and that level three takes a lot of your mana. So you have nine mana and it takes three of it. 
Um, if you have ice once, it would only cost two mana. And if you had ice twice, it would cost one. If you had it three times, you could cast that ice attack without worrying about mana. Now, those aren't the exact numbers, to be sure, but that puts that um, just kind of illustrates the more you have of a certain element, the cheaper it is for you to do those particular movesets. Mm -hmm. And give... Given the, I know you, I know you said that the advantage disadvantage thing isn't going to be as big of a deal, but is it st is it still going to be present? Just not the primary way to win fights. Oh yes, for sure. It'll it'll be present. It'll be present, but it won't be like. I think the difference to to stress there is, it, you're not going to be able to know the outcome of a team just by looking at their elements. So if you look at the enemy team, like. Let's say we're later in this project and we have multiplayer and you're playing with a friend. You're not going to be able to um, say, wow, I know exactly how this battle is going to go because of his team. Because there's so many feats and abilities that they they will get. Um, like, let's say you're a water type and you take more from like, and you take a feat, though, that's like damp or something. And it, it makes you resist three points of lightning damage from each attack. And you take that, you max that out every... Every chance you get, you take a feat like that, then all of a sudden they hit you with lightning and it does nothing to you. You're like, what the heck, right? So like there is, it's all about how you set your characters up. No one will know who will win right from the onset. And so there, that is that difference I want to stress. But yes, there will definitely be elemental advantages and that will play a fairly, a fairly decent role. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, when it when it comes to like since the since the for lack of a better term trainer is go is going to be involved just as much in combat, are they going to be on a on their on their own approach when it comes to their particular kit and their particular means of means of contributing beyond just attacking with the sword? Yeah, so the trainer will be almost as customizable as the creature. Not not necessarily straight up. They'll have a lot more physical stats, but they um, they'll be able to learn magic and be able to cast those ice attacks and lightnings and shadows too. Um, and so they'll they'll have their set of abilities and their own set of stats. So I guess yeah, I guess they'll be very similar to the creatures in the way they approach that. The the main thing about the trainer is they can swap out any creature. So anytime you fight a creature in the wilderness or in a, in a trainer, the fight has to be even. It's part of the moral code of the creatures of this world. And I don't want to get into the story because it's a little bit long. But the So if there's one creature, only one of your guys can go out. Um, and if there's two, then it's a two-on-two two and so on. But um, the player can switch out one creature at any time or he can start out. It doesn't matter. But um, he's the only one that can do that. And so trainers are a little bit harder because they have the trainer that can switch out in addition to the creatures. Mm -hmm. the, the main thing to play around with the trainers, though, is your sword that's enchanted that's pretty nice, it and the gem that you've put in it, you got to be careful because if you get the finishing blow, it'll suck the creature in whether you want to or not, the one you're fighting. So you actually have to be careful how you play your trainer to and when you use him because he can help fight when they're all full of life and whatnot, but if he accidentally gets like a super critical, you might waste that really cool gem you've been using just for the enchantment in it for your sword to be strong. So you gotta be you gotta be a little bit careful of how and when you deploy certain weapons and when the trainer does his thing. And you wanna avoid killing them with the creature if you want to catch them. So there's just things like that. To consider. Mm. Yeah. So, given that, given that, is is it a case where what would be the what would be the equipment section in a lot of other RPGs is built around the sword and the equipped sword and what um, what gems are within it? Yeah, that would be the main equipment thing. There will be other items, but th that will be the biggest. The biggest role, right, would be your combination of your sword and your your gem with your player. Mm -hmm. But 
mostly it'll be the feats and abilities as they level up that'll really um, like for instance you might get a feat at a higher level that says you can use two cleavers and so then your characters dual wielding them and then you choose each time which one you're going to use on which because they'll have elemental advantages and whatnot too. Mm -hmm. So most, most of the customizing will happen in the feats and abilities. But yeah, the ma main equipment's going to be that that sword and the gem for your player. And I'm, ge I'm guessing that when it comes to how character development goes, it is going to be relatively freeform for the player. Not really yes. based on an arch on a class or an archetype system. Yeah, so there, there will it'll be pretty, pretty free form. Um, the, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but that's the answer there. Uh, now, being being it being a open world affair, obvi obviously, just just combat isn't get, isn't going to be enough. Oh, with that in, with that in mind, what what would you have? What would you have planned? What would you have planned for the big for the bigger exploration of things? I know that with with something like Pokemon, it's built around the it's built around going between the gyms. Since you're obviously not going to be doing something like that, um, what how do how do you plan on addressing the? Loop that's that's often seen in console style RPGs of town, field, and dungeon. Yeah. So have have you ever played? Um, and it's a pretty bad example, but like Far Cry Five. Yeah. So the way that that works will be is similar to how our system is going to work. They have like a map that's divided into areas. Okay, and then there, there's like a big bad guy in that game in each area, and you have to do things like take out the head captains or get a loot chest or whatever you have to do, and it raises your like infamy level in that area until it hits certain points, and then you have certain um, cutscenes until eventually you get to face the big boss, and then you win that area, you move to another area, but you can go to any of them at any time, and it'll be similar to that. So. I mean, there's not like a gym per se, but there will be leaders and stuff that have, they might give you a fast travel gate to another place if you beat them, but they won't even face you until you've accumulated enough um, fame in that area, done enough things. And there's plenty of options. Like there'll be more options. It won't be like, um, like a, a path. Like you can choose whatever option. In fact, you can leave some of them undone before you hit that fame check. So you really decide how you want to play it, how you want to accumulate that fame or infamy if you choose to go the other route. And then they'll they'll accept your invitation to battle and you'll get whatever it is they're offering in that area, whether it's fast travel, whether it's a exclusive cleaver. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind is some of them will have rules on the combat that are different. So like, let's say there's a guy that says I'm the water master, right? He'd say, you can only face me with water types. So he won't even accept, even though you've got the fame and everything, you can't face him unless you choose a team of just water types. And so you're not going to be using the exact same team the whole time, um, but you'll probably be able to use the ones you like best for most of it. But there will be certain cases that you're like, well, crud, I have to raise a water team. I've done all earth and lightning up till now or something. But yeah, it'll be mostly just like a, a fame for each area. Once it hits a certain point, you can then challenge. And there'll be lots of puzzles. We're, the world's not going to be empty. Like, I feel like a lot of open worlds where they struggle is they they get so caught up in the fact that it can be an open world that they just make it so massive. But then you feel, as a player, you're just kind of walking down empty halls that are pretty. Lots of flowers, lots of trees, rocks, but there's no sustenance to it. And so our open world might be a, a little bit smaller than than most, but it'll still be quite big, but everything will be meaningful and will have like some sort of puzzle or interactive sandbox like quality to it. We don't want people just walking for the sake of walking to say, look how big this is. So in, in other words, you don't want a Ubisoft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm a bit. I'm yeah, a bit. Phil... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm a bit. Cr- I'm a bit cruel, but when it comes to when it comes to this sort of thing, but I am fair. And well, Ubisoft's insistence on having so many of their games play the same is a reason they're my whipping boy. Yeah, that is fair. <laughs> so, with that in, with that in mind, um, what would you guys be what would you guys be shooting for? As far, I realize trying to trying to nail down how how long a campaign would go is a tricky thing, but how long how long do you see do you see the main story um, going for what you guys have planned? Because it sounds like you guys are building for the idea of multiple playthroughs feeling different. Yeah, for sure. That is probably our our main focus, is that, yes, there's going to be some storyline that stays the same, right? Some elements that kind of the backbone of the whole thing, but the rest of the body should feel should feel like a unique experience each time, and, and part of that's going to be the, um, the NPCs. We're going to have it store variables and stuff during combat, like which one of your creatures did the most damage to the the opponent or what what types did you mainly use? We're gonna have a lot of checks and balances that that kind of mine information out of your encounters with NPCs. Not just combat, but that won't be a small part either. And so when you run into those players or those those uh, um, NPCs again, they're gonna remember things about you, right? They're gonna say things like, "How's I've you know I've strengthened myself. I'd I'd like to face you in your." Let's, you know, compare it to Pokemon again. Like, your Polyrath was super strong. I think I'm ready to take it on again. And then, like, oh, I see he's not in your party anymore. Like, well, when you get him again, I'd like to challenge you because, man, I've changed or whatever. And so there'll be this kind of a live dynamic feeling to all the NPCs. They'll also, they'll be, and you might be wondering, like, how do you see them in a different place? Well, the game's going to have like a mi- migratory system. Like, there's going to be certain slots in the world to be filled, like a sailor um, job or a tailor or a bandit or whatever it is. And those NPCs will fill those jobs, and then they'll migrate. They'll ha- each have their own like scheduled path where they go home, where they like to vacation. It's it's going to be all these charts that we're going to random into those slots, um, and then that kind of also depends on what kind of dialogue they'll generate. And what their loyalties are in the world, like what factions they are with, and so it should the NPC should also add to that feel of a new playthrough each time, as they have more of a lively feel. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. So, do you guys do you guys have plans on releasing a demo in the coming months? In the coming months, no, as this. This um, this Kickstarter is not looking super hot. It was our first our first try, and we were lacking in a little bit of the content that we could show. Mm-hmm. And so we're probably going to relaunch in May, and by then we'll have a lot more that you could show. And by then we'll we'll probably be a lot closer to a a playable, very you know, small demo that gives you a feel of what the game might be like. Mm-hmm. Um. But as for like the puzzle mechanics, the overworld creatures doing their thing, we've recently um, finished all of those, basically playable how they work. We haven't polished them to make them look really cool yet, but um, the animations are there, and they're just missing sound effects and particle effects. But like you can push things around, you can teleport with the shadow guy, you can start machines with the lightning guy, you can freeze foes with the like. We have that already done, so that's a big part of what. The playable demo would illustrate and show. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get behind that. So, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy to enjoy the particular bits of insanity that happen around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you, Mildred. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>